strict on time. Yeah. So let me say that uh, we are here together uh, because of uh, the city of Poznan and because of uh, uh, Professor Nadolny. And uh, we warmly welcome you, Professor Mark Jombek, in uh, Poland, in Poznan, and at Poznan University of Technology. It's uh, really our great honor uh, to welcome you uh, here. Uh, we are sure that your lecture will be, uh, uh, of course, successful, but also uh, uh, we believe that your lecture will open our minds to new ideas and perhaps uh, cooperation and uh, all positive things which are, you know, connected with uh, cooperation. Uh, well, MIT, this is, you know, a dream uh, of almost uh, each engineer, so also for me. So uh, I wasn't there, uh, but maybe in the near future, I could also visit uh, this uh, very prestigious uh, uh, university. So, uh, Professor, it's our honor. Uh, we warmly welcome you. And before uh, we start, I would like to ask uh, Professor Nadolny to, uh, to say a few words um, about uh, uh, your background and about your achievements, Professor. So, Professor Nadolny, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Sumelka. So, uh, I would like to, in a short, in a short, uh, in a short, uh, words, I would like to present our, our, our guest, uh, Professor Mark Jombek. Uh, he's a professor at the Department of Architecture School of Planning, uh, School of Architecture and Planning, Massachusetts Institute of Te Technology. Uh, Mark is since 2000, 2005, he's a professor of the history and theory of architecture at the Department of Architecture of MIT. Uh, if we look at his, um, at his car career, he obtained his master in Switzerland and at ETH Zurich, another fantastic university, another fantastic architecture school. Uh, and uh, he received his PhD uh, from History of Architecture from MIT. Uh, between the years 2014-2015, he was the interim dean of the School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, before the years 2007-2014, he was the associated dean at, this, at the School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, before the years 1996-2007, he was the director of History, Theory of Criticism at uh, MIT. Uh, he, was, he was also the associate professor of the History of of uh, history of architecture and theory at the Department of Architecture between the years 1996 and 2005. Uh, of course, the, the list of the awards of, of Mark is a, is a very is, is, is a huge. So I would like to just point to three of them: 2016 Andrew Mellon Foundation Grant, uh, 2013 Andrew Mellon Foundation Grant once again, and 2009 uh, 2009 Fulbright Senior Specialist Award. But of course, uh, the Mark is a, is a, is a, is a, um, is, a, is a person who is very much uh, uh, involved in the historical and theoretical uh, uh, discussion. So I would like to point at uh, two of his um, very interesting and very amazing books. Is, I really like it. Uh, Digital Stockholm Syndrome in the Post-Ontological Age. This is a new one. I hope there will be the next one. I'm keeping my, I keep my, my fingers crossed. Mark, maybe now you have more time. Uh, architecture of First Society is a global perspective and of course a global history of architecture. This is the short description of our guest. Uh, Mark, thank you very much once again for, uh, for this lecture. And I hope that we will see uh, in the real near future and on, on the real at our university. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for this evening and the floor is yours. Thank you um, for that introduction. And also want to thank the Poisson uh, uh, groups and the faculty uh, for the invitation to, uh, to appear for you here today. Um, and hopefully uh, this was supposed to be a live event and hopefully one day in the near future I can come um, and visit. Um, I just explained my father's Polish. So I really have a, a large interest in coming back uh, and, and, and seeing Poland in, in more leisurely way. So I'm gonna now see if I can figure out how to get the screen share going. So just give me one, one quick second.
see how does this work. Okay, great. Uh, Adam, are we, uh, we good? Yes, 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 Mark is fantastic. Thank you. It's, it's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. So, um, I want to uh, talk today generally about uh, you know, this new sort of uh, element, I guess, in the field that we talk about today a lot, which is sort of global history. But I'm going to do so in a way that is maybe somewhat more circumspect because I want to sort of frame it in, <laughs> in the project that I call sort of the, the not so global world. Um, so that we understand a little bit some of the reasoning why I believe that uh, teaching in the in a sort of a global way or in a broader way is uh, is important. So the first thing I would like to do is uh, think about, of course, you know, the crisis of globalization that we're all familiar with, and that is sort of almost an everyday uh, parlance in the conversations, um, as in, you know, in the from the 1980s into the 1990s, as a sort of the global. Uh, flow of capital and interconnection of people around around the world. And in that context, uh, we see the emergence of another phenomenon that we don't often discuss too much, but that has a direct uh, impact on our discipline. And that is something that is sort of one can generally call cultural nationalism. And it's sort of a, a, a somewhat of a vague term. So I don't want to like get too precise about about it. And I think the term itself already sort of implies uh, where, where, where I'm going. But it's not a recent sort of phenomenon in, in many respects. So it, it relies to some degree on sort of the romantic nationalism, which was a primarily a, a European phenomenon, not a global phenomenon, of the 19th century, which is sort of familiar um, to us in the European context in terms of uh, poetry, in terms of painting, a little bit in architecture, but in terms of landscape. So romantic nationalism uh, played a big part in uh, the early nation state days uh, of, the, of the Europeans um, in, you know, uh, after the uh, Congress of Vienna in 1814. Um, and it sort of had a, a direct impact in sort of building up a, a type of resonance about what is a, a nation in terms of its, uh, its, its history. The other component is um, modernization, which we normally, let's say, can associate with the early 20th century, uh, or certainly with the 20th century, which became national projects and have to do, let's say, we think of uh, electricalization with the automobiles, um, with uh, uh, other forms of professionalization of the economies. And so modernization and sort of romantic nationalism were often sort of uh, at odds with each other in the sort of the classic uh, sense. You know, modernization was about um, looking forward, whereas romantic nationalism was often about looking, uh, looking backward. Cultural nationalism is a sort of an ingenious blend uh, of these two things, uh, because you still have in some sense the romantic notion of the nation state as producing its own aesthetic culture as a separate from other nation states. But it's also connected to modernization uh, in the terms of the, especially in terms of economy and tourism and so forth. So cultural nationalism is a blend between the sort of romantic national histories and sort of the modernization histories into the sort of new formation that becomes apparent in the late uh, 20th century and is still around uh, very much sort of today. So as an, as, as an example, I show my students uh, this building um, you know, a classic building, it's a ziggurat of Ur uh, from uh, 3500 BC, roughly. Um, and then everyone nods politely and says, that's a ziggurat of Ur, but it's not the ziggurat of Ur uh, at all. It's a building that was constructed in 1983. And it had absolutely nothing to do with the ziggurat of Ur, um, except in some very, very, very rem <laughs> remote way. Um, so if you show it in class and say this is a ziggurat of Ur, you're making a pretty big uh, mistake. It's been built by Saddam Hussein, um, and every brick has on it stamps that this was built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, to glorify uh, Iraq. So one could sort of say this is sort of an absurd uh, example of uh, cultural nationalism at work. But actually, when you begin to look at uh, examples, you realize that they proliferate uh, really around, around the world. 
So this is one a little bit closer to home, sort of the, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, built in the 1860s, which was an example as, as an example of romantic nationalism, the demolished under Stalin in 31 and then rebuilt in 96, but specifically in the name of sort of national identity. So it's a building that actually uh, goes from uh, romantic nationalism to uh, from the 1860s to the 1990s in the form of cultural nationalism. So um, here we are in, in Korea, South Korea. This is a gate uh, to a palace. Uh, when the Japanese invaded, they, just, they destroyed the gate and they rebuilt it, the Japanese rebuilt it, but they moved the gate uh, three degrees off its axis in order to destroy the feng shui off the gate. So the gate physically was there, but it was uh, no longer aligned properly with the mountains. So um, recently the Korean government destroyed the Japanese rebuilding um, and uh, built, rebuilt it again, but now we turned it back three degrees uh, so that it is in the uh, appropriate uh, manner. And here we see uh, the uh, prime minister speaking at the opening, uh, which is significant because once again, I'm trying to sort of show that these buildings are not there simply as sort of tourist items, but are embedded in national imaginaries in uh, questions of uh, local pride as well. This is an example here in Singapore. So Singapore doesn't have much of a deep history. I mean, basically an island um, uh, that had become, of course, a very, <laughs> now is a very modern uh, place, but there's no like long thousands of years of history. So you're sort of surprised um, when you read uh, in the Singapore uh, you know, newspaper that, quote, events like this help to bring our community together, to bring us together as one people, to celebrate our own heritage. Well, you sort of say, well, you know, what is that heritage? Well, it's, it's you know, you know, it's, it's sort of a more fantasy than, than, than real. So our forefathers and our culture, and at the same time to let our different communities and also learn about one another. So in other words, you would think that this might be appropriate to uh, a country which has very, very deep history and very complicated maybe communities. Uh, and yet uh, Singapore is using this very uh, same language. So the point is I'm trying to make is that if we think of architecture and where it sits um, in where its history sits as an architectural historian, I'm supposed to be talking about architectural history. But what we discover is that architecture history is in some sense very much out there in the field, in the realm of politics, in the realm of national consciousness, in the realm of popular imaginaries. So, which means that in some sense, any person walking down the street uh, could be, you could see, considered to be sort of like almost like an amateur architectural historian because they will know something about the, the local history, the local traditions, and so forth. Now, all of this gets sort of uh, heated up in the context of UNESCO. So, um, you know, UNESCO World Heritage List, which started after World War II. And the idea was, of course, to protect uh, buildings that, um, you know, I mean, it was, you know, after World War II, the, you know, when they realized that buildings had been bombed. So the idea was to sort of protect buildings from uh, destruction during wartime. And the way to do that is to make this list and legally sort of protect them. And so the philosophical project on which this is grounded is something called Outstanding Universal Value. So we have three words, uh, each of them relatively complicated. You know, how do you measure outstanding? What is universal and what is value? And it's sort of like you need all three of them together in order to sort of get to uh, a, 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 a package uh, of uh, philosophical words that would sort of help uh, promote uh, how architecture gets, uh, gets preserved. But regardless of the idea that a building has to have a value outside of the nation state, the principle of getting into the UNESCO is that it supports the national claims to a building. So in other words, I in the United States cannot forward a building in Poland. That has to be done by the Poles themselves. And then once the countries sort of forward a building, then UNESCO can say, and it is say it is now 
universal. So it, it requires, if you will, a very strong national uh, um, in, in capacity and institutionalization of its, uh, the, of its uh, historical work in order to forward the appropriate buildings. So uh, some countries are better at this than others, um, uh, you know, you know <laughs> uh, mainly in Europe because you have very strong preservation movements, but uh, the rest of the world is certainly catching up. Now, the issue comes, becomes critical when we think of how these buildings are used on the national stage. And that's sort of what I'm trying to sort of remind us that it's wonderful to have buildings restored and renovated and cleaned up. But in some sense, we also have to understand the, the falsifications that come into play when these buildings are placed not just at the at some sort of local, even touristic level, but in the context of the national register of certain types of imaginaries. So this is Obama visiting Humayun's tomb. Uh, and just after it had been uh, finished, uh, uh, cleaned up uh, by, as a UNESCO site. I mean, when I first visited it, uh, it was, you know, a mess. It was, uh, you know, garbage everywhere. Uh, you know, people were selling uh, stuff and it was quite a experience. Uh, now it's a cleaned out tourist site. And of course, they're going to clean it out even more when uh, Obama comes. So the buildings like this, um, in some sense, sort of the escalation of value of the, of the historical monument are is sort of quite extreme. And you could sort of understand why buildings serve in this way, because they broadcast the message of national pride extremely effectively, sort of more, uh, more than anything else, right? More than a painting could or a poem could or, or some other form of artwork. So when, by comparison, when Clinton arrived, President Clinton arrived, um, prior to Obama's, uh, uh, some six or seven years prior, he took, he went from the air, airport directly to, to the Delhi and gave a speech. So here Obama arrives, but before he gives a speech, he is brought to the Humayun's tomb as a sort of, a, you know, encounter basically of the West and the East and where the Humayun's tomb is used as a way to symbolize the greatness and grandeur of India's past. Now, in the context of this type of presentations, we have to sort of always remind ourselves that the fantastical stage of architecture requires that it be not only just simply preserved, but it also have to be uh, embraced by a certain type of aesthetic. And I love this title of the Ballenberg Open Air Museum, it's called Picture Perfect. And, it's, and indeed, the aesthetic that is put into many of these buildings is picture perfect. There are buildings that are brought to bear into the geopolitical context, but also brought to bear in a way that has sort of cleaned out a lot of the perhaps things that we don't want to know about or the issues that are maybe more contested or complicated. So also the sort of processes by which we clean out the site, make them picture perfect is sort of is supported by uh, you know, the digital um, world. So you can go to the World Heritage sites, download, download uh, the app, and everything looks beautiful. Uh, the water's always blue, the sky's always clear. Um, it's never snowing or raining. There's never any ugliness anywhere. Everything looks you know, quite technically picture, uh, picture perfect. And of course, it's very seductive, but it's also, we have to understand a falsification of how the history in reality is, which is of course, extremely messy. And so I think we need to sort of be careful that we don't sort of make these sites so beautiful and so wonderful uh, that we sort of lose sight of what architectural history actually is and does and the, and the type of messages that we should be giving to our students. Perhaps one of the most extreme cases of this type of falsification is a site here that I'm showing you, which um, I, 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 I'm sort of gonna say, uh, I hope no one can identify, um, but if you do, you can put it in the chat room. Uh, but it's like one of the great 
sites you know in 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 the world but no one knows this side of it because this is the back uh, off this off the site this is the front which is abu symbol which was a very famous site uh, for one of the early sort of unesco sites where they took uh, the abu symbol uh, temple and uh, sliced it up into bits and pieces and re and reassembled it and when they reassembled it they put it uh, on an into an artificial mountain or hill and you can sort of see this cross section uh, through the site and you can sort of see here's the temple and here is the air conditioned uh, cave because it you couldn't just sort of stick it in the desert it'll it'll crack the granite so it has to have uh, cool to simulate as if it would be backing up into a mountain and then on top of that is this reinforced concrete superstructure and what i was showing you was uh, the access the entrance to the access tunnel uh, at the back of it but as you can see uh, that uh, no one goes there it's off limits so the tourists aren't even allowed to see it uh, so it's it's sort of basically the the tourists see one side but not the other side now this is of course you know it's a extreme example of a type of falsification um but at the other hand it embedded it's it's a sort of typical if you will of the whole register um of how these buildings um sort of live and breathe, if you will, you know, uh, very much uh, as sort of a coulisse for certain types of um, imaginaries. Now, of course, driving much of this is not just uh, the geopolitical of, of the nation state, uh, but, you know, tourism. And tourism is a, plays a big part in the, as an economic driver, is the visits to the Hagia Sophia that after it became a UNESCO site, Right, we can sort of see the, the, I don't have the recent numbers, this is only the numbers I could get, you know, from, from before, but it's already clearly up into the 3 million and, you know, COVID and Bob barring and all that type of stuff. But uh, clearly the economic incentive to, uh, to get a building onto UNESCO site, you know, is huge. So if we, you know, go to Google search and we type in Egypt, <clears throat> We see the map, and but we see you, you know UNESCO site, uh, India, so, you know the same thing, uh, Russia the same thing, Cambodia, <laughs> uh, UNESCO site you know the same thing, uh, Poland, same thing, um, and so on and so forth. So these uh, UNESCO sites themselves, however, are only part and parcel of the, a larger project that I'm trying to sort of describe, which has to do with this phenomenon of cultural nationalism, which puts together the two halves uh, in a very beautiful way. Uh, so in other words, you have the modernization projects, um, which are the hotels, the roads, the airports, the restaurants, and all these things that are sort of the supplementary uh, conditions of uh, an interconnected you know, global world, but also bring the people bring the tourists and so forth but they also bring economies they bring work they bring uh, um, uh, uh, different types of uh, of soft labor and so forth like that and then of course there's the cultural history part side of it <clears throat> and so that has to be picture perfect unesco plays its role <clears throat> as do other agencies um, there are also cultural events that get uh, constructed around these sites and of course it's very much associated as we've sort of seen with sort of national branding. So <clears throat> this is an extremely sort of large, <clears throat> um, one could say sort of an embedded project. And I'm trying to sort of say that globalization, if we sort of like, to, you know, don't look at that word itself, but we go down one layer down, right? Um, we see that it, it, it has its, its, its fingers in, in both sides of, of all of this, right? We cannot just sort of think of this side um, as sort of the, the cultural national, the national side, if you will, as opposed to it, opposed to this side, right? They're really part and parcel of one uh, very large, uh, very large system. Now, <clears throat> of course, um, it, it doesn't make always everybody happy. And uh, throughout the, the last 20 years or so, there have been many places where uh, cultural nationalism has in some sense uh, become, uh, let's say, on a more, a develop a more negative, <laughs> even a more negative uh, uh, point of view, in the sense that the people uh, will contest uh, the nature of certain types of, 
of uh, architecture. So the, the Thais were uh, particularly upset when a building that's on the border between Thailand and Cambodia, uh, what, which was sort of on the border, and it, it was very unclear as to who, who would get the UNESCO site, and it went to Cambodia, and the Thailands were very upset about it, even though it was a Cambodian, it was Khmer and not Thai. But once again, it has a lot to do with who gets the associated economy. Um, a similar problem uh, erupted between the Palestinians and uh, the Israelis. So uh, the Palestinians proposed uh, a, a site, but the proposal was rejected uh, precisely because uh, Palestine is not a sovereign state. And so therefore, uh, their uh, proposal uh, was rejected. So once again, showing how the uh, UNESCO, though it wants to sort of celebrate a type of universal uh, access to these histories and to these buildings, really relies on the sovereignty condition as the sort of the as the uh, primary conditioning of the of the narrative. <clears throat> so um, this is just sort of coming more just as an example from the news where the uh, Palestinian president. Hamas leader in Gaza warns of religious war, in fact, a new infada following the, then the Israelis' uh, subsequent decision to make uh, these various buildings uh, part of the, of the national heritage. So we see here in these particular cases, and there are others, where the question of cultural nationalism is, is used in some sense in a, in a way to uh, promote certain type of internalist, uh, internalist logics uh, even if they fly against um, the, the, the danger, you know, if even they embed themselves in the danger of conflict with neighbors. Uh, eventually, Thailand quit uh, the heritage body uh, altogether. All <clears throat> now, those issues sort of aside, what I'm trying to sort of also uh, help us to see is that if we were living in the era of romantic nationalism, uh, and we would list the, in order the sort of theoretically, or philosophically, the hierarchies, uh, poetry would be at the top, uh, as it was placed, the painting, sculpture, architecture, and ethnography would be then the subsequent list. And this is sort of how the 19th century viewed uh, the arts. Architecture was a little bit at, toward the bottom, obviously, because it was seen as uh, having a lot to do with the technical stuff, and therefore not having quite the aspirations uh, that poetry uh, could provide. But if we were to rewrite uh, the this sort of this ranking, actually today, <clears throat> architecture would be uh, at the top of cultural nationalism's agenda, and then followed by some sort of ethnographic tourism, uh, pop music, perhaps contemporary art and painting uh, would be sort of more uh, at the bottom. So architecture has become sort of a quite a. a, a is moved up <laughs> in the world uh, compared to where it might have been uh, theoretically in the in, in the in the 19th century, and um, so this is a significant change that we have to sort of that is great if we're architectural historians we're going yeah this is finally people understand the importance of architecture, but it's uh, it's there's a sort of a, a bitter pill that comes with that as I'm trying to sort of sort of explain. So. The, the rise of architecture is sort of integral to the national narratives and of course reinforced by UNESCO, sort of has impact on how architectural history is constructed and how it's taught in schools of architecture and how it's propagated. And it, it sort of impacts in particular the sort of the cultural capital of architecture, you know, and its importance in, uh, in the narratives. So what we see is that, of course, in a, a, a rise of the types of uh, books and literature that are nation centric. Now, it's, this is an old uh, uh, point of view, of course, from the 19th century onward, but uh, we have now, uh, you know, almost three times as many nations today than we had in the 19th century. So, the lot of holes that have to be have to be filled, and so there's a you know huge sort of genre of uh, architectural books, architectural history books that will go under the heading, of course, of the nation. And this is just sort of a, a, a sampling. And even though all of this is sort of quite good, I mean, I think the research is great. <laughs> it, this is not a question about the quality of the research, 
It's just how it is sort of packaged and whether in some sense, the advances that are made in, in cumulatively are not also bringing with them other types of problems that should be concerning to us. Now, when I was taught architectural history, basically uh, my, I was taught this, you know, Europe plus Egypt and Europe to the, to the US. This is how I was taught architectural history. This is back in the uh, early, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> in the 70s, uh, mid 70s in the ETH in Switzerland. And then if you were interested in China, <clears throat> or India or pre-Columbian, you had to go to find somebody who knew that stuff. But basically no one even mentioned any of this in any of my early architectural uh, education or even in my history education uh, into, the, into the 80s. These were things seen as specialist uh, items, uh, not really, uh, you know, in some sense very different, if you will, from what architectural history, which focused only on sort of the Egypt to Europe uh, to the US was. And now we, we want to reject today, of course, this point of view, which is called Eurocentrism. And of course, that puts stress on bringing into a, the conversation these other things. So what we have today is in some sense of a flattening of all of that. So we have India, US, Brazil, Cambodia, you know, but the flattening has moved into the direction of this nation centrism. So we've gone from Eurocentrism to nation centrism. And because there's so many nations, finally, you can sort of finally get your, your, your arms, so to speak, around the world. So it looks global in some sense. Um, it's certainly international, um, but is it, really, uh, is it really global? The national museums play their part and more national museums have been made in the last 20 years than existed in the previous 100 years. So we've seen a huge outpouring of effort uh, towards uh, national museums. National museums need exhibitions. Uh, an exhibition in Poland uh, on Polish architecture, uh, you know, and a Polish national museum is not gonna host an exhibition on French architecture, right? Uh, an exhibition on Japanese, in the Japanese national museum is not gonna host an, an exhibit on probably on Chinese architecture, right? That's not its, it, its mission. So the national museum ification, if you will, of certain types of uh, publics that are constructed through the museum and certain types of issues has intensified the, uh, the crisis, I think, of how we look at, uh, at the histories and architectural history beyond the border. Um, and then if we add to that uh, from largely in the, so here's sort of the museum, and we can just sort of see here the, the, the huge impact of, you know, from the 70s onward really of, of museums in many parts of the world, the national museums in many parts of the world. And of course its impact means, you know, a lot of good commissions have come out of that. This is the National Museum uh, by Jean Nouvel in Qatar, where he's trying to talk about, uh, you know, I don't know, the desert, and uh, in some sort of wind sails. Um, uh, perhaps the, the, the worst one is uh, uh, Bjarke Engels, who did a National Gallery of Art in Nuuk in, uh, in Greenland. The building will, with its simplistic coarseness and harmony with the landscape, become a symbol of the current independent Greenlandic architectural and architectural expression. Now, I'm nothing against independent, independent Greenlandic artistic expression, <clears throat> but, the building itself is, uh, is a throwback to really a very earlier, a very early age. So this is the building itself, and um, and he says it was designed specifically so that from the building one cannot see any of the surrounding urban context, which is of course comes uh, from uh, you know the colonialists you know of uh, of Belgium and others. So you can sort of see in the portrayal of the building this sort of desire to make the building look like uh, an isolated object in the landscape, looking out over nature um, as if it were, as if Greenland somehow developed uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a national consciousness uh, independently of anybody. Of course, the building is a, it's, it's a complete fraud because the romantic view is a very, only a very, maybe, maybe a fifth <laughs> of the view. Uh, this is the, the stuff that he doesn't want to look at, um, which are, uh, you know, made uh, by the Belgians. So, um, and, you know, during sort of this colonialist 
project. So, you know, it's once again shows us that we have to be careful with how we put these sort of romantic isolation projects sort of into play. <clears throat> Um, but, you know, history is very much at, at, at stake here and the architectural historians, in some sense, we have to sort of be, we have to be um, uh, concerned about how this is. So here we are at the airport in Singapore and, you know, it's, there's a building there, which is the museum, National Museum, uh, and it says cutting edge ways of presenting history, redefining conventional museum experience. The head of the museum in Singapore turns out to be the former head of their CIA, I don't know what you uh, would call this, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, he retired. And so I find it just uh, very appropriate that a, a CIA director, an intelligence director, becomes now the head of, uh, of the uh, art museum, the history museum, because in some sense there's a relationship between history and forming certain types of public opinions. So <clears throat> the secondary problem with all this is the, is the misfit that we have between the modern and, and this sort of thing, uh, which we uh, increasingly call uh, the traditional. And so in other words, the, uh, and this is being reinforced again and again in, in, arch, in architectural history. But <clears throat> traditional architecture is a very recent phenomenon, the idea, the word traditional architecture, right? It really starts in the 60s. Um, you know, Japanese, if you look at the literature, um, let's say from 19, to 1950 or 60s, uh, it was just called Japanese architecture. But after the 60s and into the 70s, all of a sudden we see traditional Japanese architecture to separate it from the, obviously from the thing that's now called sort of the modern. And increasingly traditional architecture became sort of put in front of things <laughs> in order to reflect this sort of division between the traditional sort of and the modern. And then if one amplifies that by the, the folk museums, uh, the folk villages and so forth that, that bring out what we might call traditional vernacular uh, projects, sort of we see this alliance now between sort of the, the national project when the grand scale to the national project sort of at the reconstructed sort of village scales. So what we, what we see is that traditions have become more static. They become, you know, better, certainly better research. We know more about them certainly than ever before. So that's sort of a good, but they've also become sort of static and, and, and fixed. And that result is that history, if we think of history as very much uh, about uh, dynamic forces that are at play, becomes as a consequence less global because it becomes like a shish kebab um, you can put all as, as many things you want onto the stick, uh, but each one of them is a separate, a separate thing. <clears throat> so how this is taught even in schools of art, so here we are, you know, at, at Harvard University. So you think of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from MIT, so I have a little bit of a, I can I point to Harvard University down the road as an example of, you know, how this shouldn't, should not happen, I, I think, right? So it says, you know, the It'll, the surveys of art from prehistoric period to the 19th century. So the reason it stops at the 19th century is because traditional Japanese architecture has to be seen as something separate from modern uh, period. And so we now as historians sort of accept that as opposed to wondering if that is really the right way to go. <clears throat> and then of course you have to then have a separate class which is the 19th century to the present. So this class will examine the history of Japanese architecture and planning from the mid 19th century to the present. So whoever teaches this class and whoever teaches that class, we don't know if they ever talk to each other or they ever go to lunch or they ever ask themselves, why is it that the Japanese history is split between the traditional and the modern? And isn't that really, really a tragedy uh, in, in my view? Here's a, just a book called Islamic Architecture in Indian Subcontinent. And it's a magnificent book. The author is very well known, extremely well researched. I use the book a lot, but it ends in 1839 uh, because more or less with the arrival uh, of, the, of the English. So uh, basically when he says, when the modernism arrives, this in the sense colonialism, traditional uh, architecture sort of dies. Well, it's just simply not true. 
there are many traditions survive even even today um, and so it sort of a, puts a very hard and fast uh, and determinative distinction between the tradition and modern that is almost 99% of the time a falsification. But yet, it's now become embedded in how we often understand uh, sort of the cultural national project. So here's an example where we could see the worst uh, of its sort of em embodiments. This is in uh, Seoul, uh, Korea, the Leum Museum. And uh, Bota designed um, the, what was called the Museum of Traditional Korean Art. And John Nouvelle designed a Museum of, of Modern Art. And they chose the two of them because they thought Bota was the more conservative one. He, you know, he liked cathedrals and so forth. And they chose Nouvelle because you know, he likes um, to walk around in leather jackets and <laughs> look very modern. Right. But you can sort of see the problem. We have two institutions. The two institutions don't talk to each other. Two different styles, uh, two different directors, uh, two different programs. Uh, two extremely very different things that are just sort of put next to each other completely arbitrarily. Um, and yet, because they're institutions and funded and so forth, they're, you're not going to get rid of them. They're here pretty much for the long time. And then if you go to their website, uh, you know, it'll says over here, uh, let me, you know, a permanent exhibition of traditional art, and they show a, a, a ceramic porcelain vase. And then they show the modern and contemporary. Um, and they show a modern um, uh, uh, piece here, right? With this sort of this uh, wavy elements and it's sort of a, a abstraction. And the, the, what they were explain is the Leo company, I mean, they, they're bad English, that's right? The flow of modern and contemporary art in a world through the permanent exhibition of modern and contemporary art. So this is sort of flow. Right, and they, they picked an abstraction that looks sort of flowy. And this is permanent because it's a vase and it's not going anywhere and it's very stable and so forth. So the message of course is that uh, history is permanent and stable and you know, traditional arts. Whereas the modern is flow and dynamic. Well, I'm sorry to say that actually as an historian, it's, it's the opposite. So they're actually falling into the cliche uh, that the old days, everything was fixed and permanent and, and beautiful, and today everything's a mess, right? So the modern is also so very messy. Well, um, so we have this sort of equation that they're making between traditional art is permanent versus modern art, you know, contemporary art, which is sort of flowing forever. But the historian would say, well, that's really not the case. Um, in the old days, uh, 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 it was all about flow, and it's only today with the modern nation state and the uh, borders and uh, international laws and so forth and so on, that we have the idea of things being permanent, of nations being permanent and fixed in the, in the landscape, and sort of solid objects that are not going to be moved. So it's basically, they're basically, uh, not only have they falsified the whole a problem of history as such by dividing it into traditional and modern, they actually got their signifiers uh, uh, put on backwards. So today we have something like this. This is sort of like uh, every nation has its own history. Then we add to that the national museums. And then we add to that, you know, the world heritage list. Um, and, and each nation has a, as, as a, as a few of those. And then we add to that, of course, uh, the sort of the traditional art and the traditional worlds that are sort of embedded within certain, uh, certain nations and so forth. Well, my point is that this is really not global. It sort of helps us get to something that is, you know, in the, it's better than what we had before. It's better than just bland Eurocentrism where we just thought that was the only narrative we needed to talk about and everything else was someone else's problem. This way, of course, we're seeing that it's a much more international scope, but it really misses a lot. And because of the various embedded falsifications, we're actually damaging potentially other ways of understanding history. So <clears throat> as we become more global, then traditions are more static. 
the result has been that history has become, in fact, less global in the context of sort of these sort of nation-based uh, worldviews. So that leads to the question, does the architectural institution, and we're like the architecture departments and the historians and, and, and even the faculty teaching there, have the obligation to teach history outside of its national or cultural domains? Now, I would just sort of say the answer to that, from my point of view, is yes, simply because we live in a very complicated world. We live in a world in which we share a lot with people from various places around the world. So it's imperative that we understand what other places are like, and architecture is a great way to do that. But how then do we learn these alternative questions? I mean, it's not necessarily sort of that easy. So that's the question that I've been struggling with, is how do we educate the educators? We've often misunderstood the problem is how do we educate the students or how do we educate the public? But, but we also have to remember is how do we educate each other as educators? So how do I teach something, let's say, about China when I don't, let's say, very little about it? And then I would say, well, I don't know anything about it. I, you know, I've never been there. I, you know, I'm going to have to find somebody who knows something. And then, you know, is that the right person? So we have an obligation, I think, to, in some sense, educate ourselves as educators. We don't have to be PhDs uh, on Chinese architectural history, but we, have to act, but we have to be able to point the arrows of our own interests into these other domains in order to show the way to which uh, these conversations can take place. So uh, the grant that I got, which was funded by the Mellon, helped us create a group of, of scholars that can do exactly this, which is sort of teach each other. So we go to school uh, not to teach uh, uh, his stu students, but we go to school to teach each other because I know something that my colleagues don't know and so forth down the line. And if we sort of imagine an adult education environment rather than a student teacher environment, we can begin to sort of understand some of these issues uh, that we need to do in order to sort of broaden our, uh, our sort of capacity to understand the expanded scholarly issues at stake. And that's why the survey course is a good experimental place for this because it sort of already embraces very large scale. We have an ever expanding place, uh, you know, um, in, in the world, the survey course 20 years ago is very different from the survey course today, but instead of getting rid of it, we should sort of embrace the fact that the survey wants to think very big. So this is the GAHTC, this is the Global Architectural History Teaching Collaborative. And let me see if my link will work here. I'm gonna to have to stop share and open opening and open up the link. No, I don't know how to do that. Hang on a second. So this is the, 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 the site of the GAHDC. And you can sort of see here, there's a globe. You can sort of spin it around. Whoops. <laughs> um, and um, it gives you the various sites that are uh, part of uh, lectures. So professors make lectures, they post these lectures, and then we share the lectures. So um, we can sort of uh, type in a, uh, one of the lectures. Here's Globalizing a Humanities Approach to Architectural History. <clears throat> and uh, it has a, there's a lecture, there's introduction. So we can then click on the, click on that. And then we can sort of see uh, what the, the lecture is about. We can have lecture notes, we can have handouts down here. We can preview the slides um, and, you know, come up with, um, 
the, the slide deck. And then I can uh, come up here and I can download the lecture right to my, right to my screen. So it's an extremely useful uh, you know, and, and, and convenient way in which I can share material. So I can take this lecture or I can take any of the lectures, like I can, say I can put in Poland. <laughs> um, and what we get up, come up with are a bunch of lectures where Poland is mentioned. But you'll notice there's no lecture on the history of Poland. So those are the type of things that we really are not trying to do. We assume that there, is a, there are books called History of Polish Architecture, so that stuff is out there. But we're more interested in, you know, uh, but lectures that are like this one called Peripheries of Contact, uh, Beyond Geographies and Historical Flatland, or the Medieval uh, Mediterranean and, and, and Crossroads, or Domesticity, or here, uh, West African Modernism. Many Polish uh, 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 architects uh, during the communist period uh, were sent to Africa to build cities. And so there's a huge array of, uh, of modern architecture in, in, in West Africa that was designed by Polish architects uh, or global connections and synagogues through the, through the world. So these sort of show the type of lectures that we're interested in that we think uh, stitch together the world in somewhat broader ways, not comprehensively, if you will, not sort of universally as sort of the UN wants it, uh, but sort of small stitches that, that, that cross the globe and always remind us uh, the fundamental thing, uh, the most fundamental thing, is that the world is round. Nation centrism basically is a flat world uh, model. And, you know, even though we all know the world is round, we often teach the world as if it were still flat. So we were looking for ways in which we can sort of talk about architectural history, but always remind us that, they're, that, the world, um, that the world is round. So let me get back to my screen share, if I can, a minute. So, um, so basically it's a teacher to teacher environment. So it's sort of seen as a, as a supplement to, if you will, the, the cultural national projects, which are there and they're not gonna go away. But we think architectural schools can provide an important opening to the types of worlds and the type of architectural history thinking that, that we think are quite, quite necessary. So in, in conclusion, I just want to sort of show this slide, which I want to sort of talk about just for a second. In other words, whereas cultural nationalism tends to be world closing, uh, not because it's closing itself off from the world as such, but it sort of tends to sort of be a worry about its own sort of internal histories. Whereas the histories itself, any historian will probably hopefully, you know, uh, affirm, are, are often quite messy quite entangled and quite complicated. And so these are the type of histories that we have to also be talking about. And the architectural history is an avenue to sort of talking about our entangled relationships with things over the horizon, with things on the other side of rivers and the other side of, of borders. And in that sense, it, it open creates a possibility for world opening, which I think is increasingly important in the 21st century. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, take the comments. Uh, Mark, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, fantastic lecture. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing uh, comments. Uh, so now I would like to, to open the discussion. So uh, at this moment, uh, our, uh, it's okay, you can use the chat if you would like to ask the question to our, uh, to our, um, to our guests. Uh, please don't hesitate to, to, to do this, of course. Maybe, uh, okay, because, because, uh, because uh, Agnieszka is uh, together with me, we are both, uh, we will try to, 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 to manage this. Uh, so, okay, uh, maybe I will start uh, this discussion. Mm, so you, uh, you show us the, the very interesting example with uh, coming from India, uh, from the visit of President Obama, 
Uh, and so the interesting point for me is that, do you think that uh, we should talk about the, the buildings which we treat as a heritage in a way, like you said, the natural or clean? Do you think that the, let's say, the, um, the natural objects which we call heritage are more suitable to the context of the place? Or can we try to uh, clean them or let's say uh, add some, let's say some, some special things to be much more, uh, let's say, touristic, like you, like you may, may mentioned before, Mark? Well, um, it, you know, it, it, it all depends. I mean, I think we all want our buildings to survive. So that's just, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Ruskinian where I think we should let the buildings rot and fall away, you know, um, I think that'd be a real shame. So, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to preservation. So it's, it's not so much, you know, the work of preserving the buildings as an artifact. It's a, what the problem is, the, the cultural work that sneaks in. Now, in many cases, I can understand the Taj Mahal is going to be a national monument or the Humayun's tomb is going to be a national one. We cannot stop um, the nations or our own uh, local desires to celebrate these architectural things. So, um, you know, and so in some sense, we, we can sort of ask for certain types of breaks because at some moment, these buildings become artifices. They become uh, curiosities more than historical realities. The, grand, the vast majority of buildings, let's say, that are not captured by that, um, allow uh, it, often for a more robust historical uh, capacity um, where we as architectural historians can show buildings operating not in the frozen, frozen world of, preser mm -hmm. of, of preservation, but in the, in the continuity of being pre preserved, enacted, used, misused, and so forth. Buildings are themselves often extremely dynamic, you know, many buildings don't survive and we, sh we have to talk about those, you know, as well, you know. So the trouble with often preservation is we, we focus too much on the buildings that have survived and try to overcook their narrative. Whereas uh, hundreds and thousands of buildings that haven't survived are just yes. sort of more or less forgotten. Mm -hmm. And our textual historian, you know, doesn't want that uh, to be just it, it abolished, right? There are many, many buildings and stories that go along with buildings that are no longer there that need to be supplemented into this uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Agnieszka, maybe we would like to add something? Well, in um, uh, addition to, to the question that you stated, um, uh, well, do you have uh, the experience in how to um, protect those small narratives of, uh, on the scale of the nation uh, in comparison to a totally needed, probably, uh, narrative of the world heritage, meaning that what you said about those cleaning of the, of the site and uh, about, let's say, isolating a... Uh, 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 elements of the uh, of the world heritage is um, making those those elements more approachable for the global community. That's for sure. But then it is diminishing the local uh, narrative and local local identities, uh, which was in connection to to those uh, uh, to those buildings. So, do you know how to prevent from uh, declining of those local na narratives, but still helping to? to put those buildings uh, into the, identific the worldwide identification? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, that's sort of like the million dollar question. You know, okay. <laughs> if, 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 if I had the answer, it like, I, you know, we'd be, we, we could go home and, you know, drink a beer and we'd be done. Uh, that is the question one has to ask again and again and again, you know. Um, so let me just maybe, give a very quick sort of type of uh, thought project. You know. So in other words, if I'm saying that the, 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 the mega buildings of the national imaginary, we know how to bake that, right? Okay. Yeah. And there are people out there who do that for a job and a living and okay. No, no, no. Vernacular has also been baked into the system with our village constructions and so forth like that. What's, lost 
is, is not the high architecture and not, so to speak, the vernacular stuff. What's lost in some sense is sort of a big range of middle buildings, which are like, you know, not needed to be preserved. They're just regular houses or barns or regular uh, factories or uh, stories associated with particular communities or so forth and so on, right? They just sort of come and go because architecture comes and goes and people come and go and wars come and go. And so in this sort of dynamic environment in, the, in that middle that, that is not now baked is a sort of the more elastic yeasty stuff, which is largely forgotten and ignored, but have very big opportunities to talk about the communities that don't exist anymore in particular places, um, uh, activities that don't exist anymore in particular places, or, or still might. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be all about what's not there, right? It could be also what is there. And these operations, um, I mean, they, they, it could be local. I mean, they are local in that sense, um, in the sense that they're not national and they're not local vernacular, mm -hmm. you know, 5,000 years ago, this is how people lived, you know, that type of thing, right? But maybe 100 years ago or 200 years ago, you know, this sort of a shorter, shorter time frame. Um, th this is a huge amount of stuff. And we often forget how complicated that world was back then. We look back now and we say, oh, you know, everything was, was fine and it's only complicated today. Well, that's, that's not true. Not certainly not true in Poland, uh, not true in the United States, even though we have much shorter history. It's not, it's not true sort of anywhere. And I think architectural history can bring out these complexities, the multiplicities, the missing voices uh, that often were in local communities. Uh, and it can be done, I'm doing a project uh, now, I did a project in Lifta, which is a Palestinian town uh, south of uh, Jerusalem, and we used uh, uh, virtual reality headsets. And we went to the archives, <clears throat> and we had the students sort of pick out material from the archives. And so when you're walking around, and then we scanned Lifta into a virtual reality space. And so as you're walking around the, 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 the village in the virtual space, the archive images come up. And so you can look and turn and then there's a photograph, uh, there's a document, there's a poem that someone is reading and so forth and like, like that. So if you type in my name and MIT and LIFTA, L-A-F-T-A, uh, you'll see that. Uh, can, I, can you say it again? Just write it down once again? Yeah, LIFTA, L-I-F-T-A, Pal Pal Palestine. Uh, well, it's in Israel, but Palestinian. Okay. And I'm yeah. doing now a similar project in the Tiergarten in Berlin, mm -hmm. where once again, it's a virtual reality. We, we, we scan in the Tiergarten, so you can virtually go to the Tiergarten. But what we're doing is also that as you're walking, different documents appear. And you can then say, oh, that's an interesting document. You can look at it with your glasses, mm -hmm. and then it'll take you to other documents. So it's a, it's a multimedia environment that allows you to walk through the tear garden, but look at um, the murders that took place or look at the battles that took place or look at um, the, the, the particular type of roses that were planted there in, in, in 1890 um, or, or the forest, whatever it is, topics you might want. So that's maybe one way to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. to, to use virtual reality. Of course, it's a little bit high tech, but I think it's important to also just think low tech. Low tech research helps as well, right? So okay, because we are in the middle, easy. Because I would like to come back to this uh, to this example you 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 show us um, dedicated to uh, to the heritage. Uh, so do you think that the politicians that the politicians can destroy the idea of the heritage? Because you you show us a fantastic examples that. The UNESCO didn't put on the list because the, 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 because the country let's say didn't doesn't exist in fact. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that the politicians can destroy the, the idea of the heritage with that kind of uh, let's say uncontrolled um, movement? So. Yes, yes, I think that can easily happen. In other words, this once again it gets overbaked um, and simplified, and it's you know it, it speaks to a type of you know, I understand that the general person on the street doesn't necessarily have all the patience <laughs> for to hear, well, there are a lot of complications, you know, uh, you, you know, they, they want nice and simple stories. 
and I understand that. And I think that there's to some degree of value to that. So I'm not saying it's all wrong, but I'm saying that I think we have an obligation to try to make the more complicated stories also accessible. And those complicated stories are usually stories about hybridities, non-alignments, people moving across border, you know, these types of stories that are also there, but really are a little bit harder to tell. And so what we have to do is how to figure out ways to get people to pay attention to those stories and, and not make them into just sort of disciplinary uh, scientific projects that are only interesting to, you know, the architects or architectural historians themselves. You know, that's what I'm sort of saying. So we have a, we have we have a question from Professor Sumelka. Um, uh, in your opinion, what are the leading trends architectural science? What would you recommend for young sciences? If um, you look at the, yeah, if you look if you look at the chat, please, so you can you can find. Yeah, you uh, maybe Adam, you can sort of explain to me a little bit. It may be a translation in architectural science. Is that a special? I mean, are we talking about like um, engineering or are we talking about more just architecture education in general? Pro Professor Sumalka, you, you have to explain a little bit more. Is he, I mean, is this more about historians or more maybe, about Maybe, uh, uh, I hope that you can hear me. Uh, just yeah. uh, shortly, because I, I see a lot of uh, young people on the list of uh, participants, so maybe you could recommend some, you know, uh, maybe not trends, but maybe, uh, in your opinion, uh, the best ways to to deal with architecture or whatever. Yeah, I call it altogether architectural science. I see. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Well, it's, 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 uh, I mean, my gosh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be here all night. Uh, so w w one of the problems we face, um, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't know your schools intimately, you know, very well, but I know we face in, in the, in the U S is that architecture students, uh, you know, come in, but they have three and a half years to get a degree. They take, maybe a history course or maybe something, but basically they're not interested anymore in history. So what we have today is a pedagogy that is very modern, modernist. It's very much like get out into the world and make, make beautiful buildings, great buildings, you know. Um, and the problems associated with, with history are usually seen as like, oh, take a course, you know, just do that somewhere. It's not integrated into their thinking. And so everything, everyone just does something modern now. And you know, it used to be at MIT, there were, you had to take five uh, history courses. <clears throat> and then it was four. And now it's three, of which you can get out of one if you've, take, if you've proven that your grandmother uh, knew a lot about history, you know, or something like that, you know? So you could go to MIT and graduate and only take two courses. And it's like, it's gotten less and less and less and less. And of course, now to, to, they had to do that in order to replace it with computers, computer and materials and fabrication courses, which I think are uh, a, a very sad moment because I feel very strongly that architecture is, is still, at least half of it is a humanities discipline. Architects speak to the world. They speak to their clients. They speak to their culture. They speak to their communities. If they don't know the, the nature of these communities, or they don't know the nature of cultural complexity in a, in a complicated world, they're gonna be illiterate. They won't be able to understand that not everyone just wants a modern box or that there may be other solutions. So I don't know how it's been you know, in your school, but in our school, I would say it's been on a downward trajectory. And so the, the idea that architects are cultural people is on the decline in the US. And you know, you always sound very old fashioned about it when I, when I speak that way, but I'm trying to not be old fashioned. I'm trying to say we live in this global world where understanding cultures is in fact more important uh, than ever. Because you can easily make a mistake by misunderstanding, you know, um, and you lose an opportunity. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Mar Marta, Marta, would you like to ask some questions? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes. Marta, <laughs> you, can read, you can read from in my mind. <laughs> um, to be honest, I had a very interesting discussion on similar topic with the students in the fifth year. And they asked me a very difficult question. Um, what are we supposed to do if a very important heritage building, cultural, uh, very important from the point of view of culture, local culture or national culture building, like for example, Hagia Sophia or anything else that is that important, uh, is destroyed due to different types of activities, like, I don't know, war or volcano eruption or hurricane. Shall we rebuild it or shall we forget about it? Or shall we, what shall we do actually? What is our, responsibility <laughs> as architects. Um, what do you think about this question? Um, we discussed it like in half an hour. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. I think what we have been trying to do since the, let's say, 80s, is to forget about it. Let's find out what it would look like in whenever it was, 1820 or 1720, and let's spend a lot of effort and scientific analysis to understand all of that. and put it back the way it was. <clears throat> um, I remember I, I went to Melk in Ger Southern Germany and we I went to the uh, monastery there that had just been restored. You know, it was 1999 and it looked like exactly like it had just been built in 1620. And, you know, it's sort of like frightening because, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not wearing 1620 clothes, you know. And of course, they added bathrooms and Wi-Fi, you know, things like that. So it's like cheating, you know. You go into a building that is being completely restored, 100% like the 17th century, and everything else has been forgotten. And then you look at the pictures, and it had gone through transformations. It had done this, it had done that, it had been bombed, and so forth and so on. Very complicated history. And all of that is just wiped away. And I think it's, it, this is exactly the opposite of where we need to go. And, you know, you're not going to get a job as a preservationist if you say, I want to preserve one wing as a, as a bombed out structure, right? Okay, you're not going to get the job. But I don't think I'm, I have my debates with my faculty all the time. I say that my, our job in the academic world is not always to make sure that all students, 100% of them, go into the profession. There has to be a place where we can talk about things that are not acceptable to the profession but our acceptable, but our thought projects to get us to remind ourselves of alternative ways of practicing. So, you know, they're trying to restore the secretariat in Chandigarh now. And so if someone asked me, so Mark, what would you do? I said, well, I know what I would do. I would take the building, I would put three, three lines, one, I divided into three, 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 three things, just arbitrarily, it doesn't even matter where. One third, I would, I would have the preservationist people come and restore it just like Corbusier had built it back in 1950s. One, I would just leave, uh, you know, leave today, just let it be, fall into a ruin or whatever it is, right? Uh, and the third, <clears throat> I would transform into a hotel, you know, and, and, and sort of, let's say, ruin it, <laughs> you know. Um, you know but you can't do that because buildings are sacred cows. They're, you know, they, from the nose to the tail, they're supposed to be one thing. And I'm saying to one of the things we could do is sort of stop treating buildings as sacred cows. You know, we can operate on the nose and operate differently on the tail. Why not? Now you're not gonna get a job in the preservationist, I understand that, but it, at least it might open up a conversation about why is the building always one thing? And that's, you know, a, 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 Oh, sort of weird that we have this fetish that buildings are singular objects and have to be treated singularly and therefore the historical fabric is singular, right? Okay, when, thank you. You know, so I don't know if that helps, but uh, great conversation okay. for you to have with your students. Okay, so we have another question, uh, Agnieszka. So we have, a, we have a question from Hassan. Hassan maybe Hassan can, can ask yeah, that's right, maybe. himself, that's, yes? Yes, that's uh, right. Okay, uh, can you hear me, professors? Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Yajonbak for this uh, beautiful and uh, great lecture. Uh, actually, in my opinion, uh, the problem with recognizing uh, the historic society is that 
through architecture, we could just uh, evaluate and assess just some heritage monuments which are remains from the uh, history. And uh, these are, uh, of course, they are just selective parts of the history. And most of the time, they cannot reflect the ordinary lifestyle of that specific cultural life. Because uh, in many uh, uh, specific places, like, for example, Iran, uh, based on my background, lots of ordinary houses are ruined through the history. And just some uh, governmental building and very specific and special building remains as heritage. And, uh, you know, uh, the governments uh, like Iran uh, are very happy to uh, celebrate this uh, heritage because they reflect uh, uh, their power and their dignity as the government. But we cannot understand the whole truth of the history just by some selective buildings. And uh, I don't know uh, how we can uh, change the attitude to uh, know and recognize the exact and the truth of the history by uh, studying the heritage buildings and how to attract other people that this is the point that uh, we have to search more and more to find out about the essence of the historic uh, society, not just uh, by analyzing some selective parts of the history as uh, cultural heritage. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and please, I think, you know, they have uh, you know, pe you know, historians, you know, I don't know if you're a future historian or an architect, you know, on the ground with that sensibility is exactly what we need. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the everyday, it's the past everydays, you know, it's the forgotten things. Um, these are extremely important and, you know, almost the duty of architectural historians to make sure that these things uh, are, are not uh, made invisible, uh, you know, by the grand narratives. Um, and it can be done in any number of different ways. There's no right way or wrong way, you know, in some sense, right? It depends a little bit what means you have at hand. Um, but often it, it requires, you know, as a, you have to sort of resist the, 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 the seductions of certain types of instrumentalities that already want you to do something in a particular way. And so I think we can begin to sort of thicken that uh, landscape of history, as, as, as you sort of to, to put in a word of what you're trying to say, Hazan, um, and that and that takes 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 time, and I think it takes a certain amount of effort, and I think that's where the institutions of architecture schools can come in. Um, in India, the, the they send the schools to on drawing exercises. So um, when I would go to South India and I would look at a temple, there's no plans being published ever on these things. I would go to the local architecture school and they say, oh yeah, we got, we, you know, every year we, the students are sent to draw plans, you know, as exercises. And they would give me these wonderful plans that have been drawn by the students, you know. Um, but for them, it was a meaningless activity because they're just learning how to me measure a building. But even just measuring a, a building can have be important because, you know, no one had ever measured it before, right? But they're, in, they're locked up in the schools of architecture in Kerala and no one had ever thought that these might be important. So even publishing those would, would be good. So it's not just you know, writing his history about it, it's also measuring buildings, looking at them, making documents. Um, you know, these, these are very classical forms of research uh, that are um, you know, as still remain important. And, you know, and then what I'm trying to also argue, hopefully if I can just add one sentence, you know, it's also your frame of mind, right? So what I'm trying to sort of say with the Global History Collaborative is by talking to each other we, and sharing each other's work, we actually learn to look for things that we hadn't thought about looking for, which is important. <clears throat> if I may, 
add one one thing because we're from the departure of history. Both Adam Nadolny, Professor Piotr Maciniak is with us as well, and I think yeah, that's right, yes. to that too. Yeah, so yeah. we are very very widely represented, and we have we want to share that the experience of inventory practices <laughs> really are uh, surprisingly uh, informative for our students. Meaning that whenever they are measuring measuring the historical buildings, they are getting involved in the uh, let's say the cosmology of that building and at, at the beginning it's only a task a very repetitive task but after a while they're really very often are saying that the um, you know the directness of this contact with this historical tissue is uh, is really helping out to understand the, the the importance of heritage so that's that's one thing that you that that's in, addition, in addition to what you said but uh, i um if i may uh, share one another thing that i see that the problem with the, uh, teaching history of architecture is very often connected with the very much more general uh, problem with Polish pupils, that we are taught the general history in the sense of wars and disasters and, and uh, turbulences. And basically, we have only the sequence of turbulences. And uh, normally, young people cannot attach to, the, to, to it naturally. And well, I cannot blame them. Uh, so, so narratives about the, that the history is truly a story of people that were living in the pre previous periods is not present in a, in a, a Polish uh, educational system. That if, if it's present, it's very, very uh, minor in the whole discourse. Yes, and I see the same thing uh, in uh, then talking about the history of architecture the history of architecture, that we are basically talking about buildings which served for the, let's say, some kind of a propaganda of the state or were, were important from the standpoint of this big narrative and we're, we're only to some extent obviously including the you know the, the uh, architecture rep uh, representation of the general people yes of the of the you know the uh, societies of course we are trying to build up more uh, on that but we are going through this this general information on the courses so it's all about churches all about museums all about the uh, governmental uh, and uh, you know kings uh, uh, residences and palaces and uh, back, excuse me give a chance to our guests to answer the question yeah yeah so, so <laughs> yes i will i will so I'll, I'll end it up sorry okay. uh, so how do you address the problem that the heritage is uh, treated as as a, as a tool so even a history general history is treated as a tool to pass on the general the big narrative and in the history of architecture i see that too that that basically uh, uh, also the, the, this narrative is is a tool for for passing a uh, yeah the, the the set narrative and also with the uh, protection of the remainings of this heritage well, the protection of monuments it is also uh, uh, that the, the, uh, the well the heritage is very often treated uh, and and the state is protecting uh, protecting only those buildings that are adding up for the, this general big uh, narrative so what is your experience in that and how do you you know solve solve it uh, uh, in your, in your, let's say, experience. I would, you know, in the, in, first, you know, in the U.S., generally speaking, we don't have our, the problem is not pitched quite as dramatically as it is in, in Europe or in Asia around the question of heritage. Because um, we, no, we, we, our history isn't that long, um, and the preservation uh, industry is, is not, is often aligned with the private sector more than with the national um, imaginaries. So we we have a somewhat, I say, a more in the U.S. as I mean, it doesn't mean it's any better. I'm just sort of saying it 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 has a slightly more. It's like a slightly bigger option of how to handle the question without Im immediately falling into uh, the problem of what the word heritage as a word means in a conversation. You know, every time I, 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 I use that word or hear it, you know, it sort of feel like I've swallowed a big apple. You know, I don't know how to digest it, you know, because it's a word that we're, we have to use. Everyone asks, like, what, what do we do? Well, in a way, the first thing is to stop using maybe the word heritage and, and going back to a simpler word like history. <laughs> you know, heritage already says I'm, it's done, right? In other words, you know, like that's what I meant like by baking it, right? You, you can't 
take the bread and make the, find the yeast in it anymore, right? The, the, the yeast is already gone, right? You can't find the grains anymore, right? Um, what we want to do is we want to go back to moments where we can sort of understand that there's the yeast, the grain, there's, okay, there's the energies that go into its making and so forth like that. And maybe we can add some more salt or spice. Maybe we can transform the baking. But once it's already baked, it's really hard to go, go back in time. And so part of it, I would say, is to, I mean, maybe I think of that word as like thickening, to, to, to thicken the conversation, because heritage wants to thin it, you know, and monumentalize it, clarify it, simplify it. And our job is to sort of, you know, make sure that we understand it's a very thick, thick description. And, if, and thick descriptions allow us, as, even as architects, to begin to say, well, maybe the building doesn't have to be, you know, once I said, you know, from beginning to end one thing, you know, you know, the, 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 the churches, the cathedrals in Europe, you know, took 500 years to build. So you have also two different styles and so forth. Like for, for hundreds of years, they were open <laughs> to the sky <laughs> because they hadn't finished them yet, you know. Um, it's a very modern thing to think of buildings as sort of fixed objects in the landscape. And because of that, we fetishize uh, that and heritage has sort of glued, put the super glue around all of that, that sort of glues it into place into one, one thing. And I think we just need a more experimental attitude um, that can be done in the academic environment where we maybe can do heritage on Monday and non-heritage on Tuesday, Ruskin on Thursday, uh, you know, um, what, what would that sound like, right? You know, um, you know, um, I, I, you know, once again, I, I don't really have the answer. These are things each place will have to experiment with, with what they're com comfortable. Um, but clearly experimentation, I think, is in order because, um, you know, I think as you're pointing out, the drift has been to sort of fix the project in a particular way. And then that's it, and no conversation is is, is allowed. Um, so, first, re realizing the problem, and I think that's what you're we all do, 